Hi, and welcome to the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition's first ever Heartland Summit. I'm Dan Glickman, Senior Advisor to the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, former Secretary of Agriculture, former Congressman from the 4th District of Kansas, and co-chair of USGLC's Kansas Advisory Committee. And I might add a recently published author, so I hope you all go out and buy my book, but that's a secondary issue. And more things that probably you want to know. But in any event, I wear many hats, but one thing remains constant. I am a huge fan of America's Heartland and the USGLC. For over 25 years, USGLC has been building a safer, better world. We are over 500 American businesses and humanitarian organizations. Our bipartisan National Advisory Council, chaired by Secretary Colin Powell, is made up of our nation's top national security and foreign policy leaders and experts, including most every living former Secretary of State. Our National Security Advisory Council is comprised of over 200 retired military officers, admirals, and generals. Our Veterans for Smart Power initiative is made up of 30,000 veterans from across the country who are committed to strengthening our non-military tools. And across the heartland, those on our advisory committees are Republicans, Democrats, and independents. We are leaders of the local business, humanitarian, and faith communities. We are civic officials and military veterans. We are local leaders sharing how America's role in the world does matter to American families and to our country as a whole. Together, we talk about why a tiny 1% of the federal budget, 1% called the international affairs budget, is one of the most cost-effective and powerful investments that America makes. It is sometimes called the foreign aid budget, but it's really much more than that. That 1% investment is effective, accountable, transparent, and it delivers for the American people. You might say that 1% is worth quite a bit. So I'm so glad you are here with us today. Now let's get this summit started. Thanks. Greetings from Indiana. I'm Raju Chintala, and I believe there is no better day than today to discuss the future of Heartland. I'm Susie Wynock, joining you from the great state of Iowa, and I'm proud to be building a better future for the Heartland community with all of us. Yes, I am Mike Stavansky. Hello, everyone. I'm a member of USGLC's Veterans for Smart Power, joining today with veterans in Kansas and all across the heartland. Hi, Brunidi Karadia here, Chief of Operations for Transfer, a minority and women-owned company here in Michigan. I'm looking forward to hearing from all the voices that make up the heartland. I'm Catherine Bruns, greeting you from the center of the heartland, Minnesota, and I'm proud to represent USGLC's first ever class of next-gen global leaders. Good morning. I'm Kip Kendrick, uh, former state representative here in Missouri, and I'm delighted to talk about how leading globally matters locally today. Hi, I'm Zane Francis Scott, and I'm happy to be here uh, from Seward, Nebraska, in the Cornhusker State. Uh, I'm excited to uh, be here with you today and learn alongside you. Uh, Go Big Red. Hi. uh, Hello. I'm from the great state of North Dakota. I'm Julie Ramos-Lagos, and I'm looking forward to seeing some great faces and incredible places today during our conference. Hi. I'm Aaron Cordell coming to you from Ohio, the Buckeye State. I'm so proud to join the USGLC for this very important day of discussions. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Udak, and greetings from Wisconsin, America's dairy land. As the nation's leading dairy producer, my fellow Wisconsinites and I are delighted to join you today for this incredible day to celebrate the heartland. Well, that was a fabulous roll call. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Schreyer, President and CEO of the USGLC, and I want to welcome everyone to USGLC's first ever Heartland Summit. We have been building towards this moment for some time, and we couldn't be more excited to join with you and thousands of leaders from across the Heartland. You just got a little taste of it. But we're going to journey across the country together with stops in several states along the way, talking with members of Congress, business leaders, veterans, mayors, to focus on America's role in the world and what it's worth for, to local communities across the heartland. You know, our journey to the heartland began years ago. I, I grew up in the, in the region and still to this day, even though I live in Washington, D.C., somebody asked me where I'm from, I'm proud to say the Midwest. And so I know a little something about those who live on the East Coast or the West Coast that don't always listen carefully enough 
to our fellow citizens from the central uh, center of our country. So that's why a few years back, we started this initiative to focus on America's heartland, to listen and engage in a conversation about America's role in the world and why it matters locally. And the whole idea was to hear from you, to amplify your voice. So my colleagues and I, we, we traveled, we saw a lot of you, met a lot of you to host forums in rural and mid-sized cities and towns, to meet with mayors and local legislators, university and civic leaders, farmers and faith groups, hosting members of Congress. And, and part of what we did is we sought out to deepen our engagement in the re region. And I gotta tell you, we couldn't have been more proud to join with the extraordinary team of Cargill to form what we called our Heartland Partnership. I look forward for you to meet with one of their senior execs to hear from them, but a big thank you to the entire team who really works to make a better and safer world. Now, I have to tell you over the last 18 months, you will understand that the, the global pandemic made all of our work a tad more logistically complex, but it also showed how significant this work was. We, we met virtually. Uh, and continue to host our town hall meetings. And some of you joined us when we hosted people like Senator Jerry Moran in Kansas and in Illinois, Representative Adam Kissinger and Jan Schakowsky or in Minnesota, Representative Tom Emmer and the list goes on. But it created, one of the things I saw is it created opportunities for elected officials like we're gonna do today to engage with their local constituents and talk about why global engagement matters to our health and our economic recovery in the midst of a global pandemic. With Cargill, we launched an executive roundtable series with my colleague, Alex Grant, where we traveled to city after city throughout the region and had powerful conversations of a locally driven foreign policy. Now, I'm not gonna do justice to, to what we discussed, but let me give you a few takeaways to give you a flavor of what we discussed. We heard loud and clear, our engagement matters in, in, in from the world. We heard stories about our healthcare, like the Pfizer plant in Kalamazoo, Michigan, that's producing and exporting the life-saving vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, we heard from members of the Wisconsin National Guard who work with the State Department to partner with National Guards in Nicaragua, not only keeping our forces out of harm's way, but also keeping us safe here at home. We met with lots of companies around the region, uh, including Genius Bio Bioenergy in Skokie, Illinois, who are working with the US government to, to, to use nanotechnology in the developing world to convert farm waste to fuel. You know, the list goes on. There's so many connections and stories about supporting jobs and showcasing the best of America and creating healthier and more secure world. So that's why we at the USGLC launched the, the most significant investment ever in a new campaign to tell this story. And we asked one question. We asked, what's it worth? What's it worth to ensure that a global pandemic never, ever happens again? To stop the next global crisis before it spirals out of control, to, to help get our recovery back on track. You know, today, in the midst of the global pandemic, these, these issues, these challenges matter more than ever to every family. If, if you're like me, you sit around with your family at your kitchen table, and, and we're worried about keeping our kids in school, about paying our bills, about fears for our health, and for me, you know, my elderly parents. And so I ask, you know, foreign aid, diplomacy, global health, what's it worth? And it means healthier lives here at home. It means safety for those who serve. It means more customers for all of our businesses. So what we're finding is this message is resonating. In fact, today, in connection with our summit, mayors and cities are issuing US Heartland Global Leadership Proclamations on what it's worth for their communities to be engaged on the global stage. Whether it's the pride felt in Fort Wayne, Indiana with their sister city relationships, or Bismarck, North Dakota, where farmers in their community 
are helping feed the world in addition to supporting 120,000 jobs in their state. There are proclamations also in Milwaukee, Wisconsin today, Topeka, Kansas, Geneva and Fremont, Nebraska, Toledo, Ohio, Laporte and Kokomo, Indiana. These mayors publicly are recognizing that global partnerships are key to ending COVID-19 and that leading globally matters locally. So a big shout out to those mayors and communities for speaking out. You can all see these stories and, and visit in a newly launched USGLC Heartland Hub. We're thrilled with this brand new platform to highlight not just these stories, but your story and your impact and keep informed of what's happening in your local community. So the last thing I wanna say before we get our panels going is now it's time for you to do a little bit of work today. Here's what I want you to do. Don't, don't close out of the Zoom, but what you can do is stay on your Zoom, but go to your browser. You're gonna to go to heartland.usglc.org. And I'm gonna ask you to do three things in the course of, of the conversation today. One is a fun thing. Uh, I'll take my phone out and you can, you can actually go on a Heartland Summit photo booth. If we were in person, you could just walk over there, but you're gonna take a, a picture of yourself joining on here and post it on social media. So I hope you take a chance to do that. Second, and this is probably the most important, is to share your story. There's a feature on the, on the Heartland Hub that says share your story and tell us how America's global engagement impacts you. Firsthand experience is the best. And then just so we get a chance to get to know one another and who's participating in the chat function on Zoom, introduce yourself, Liz from Washington DC, but originally from the Midwest, as I said. So just tell us your name and where you're from. So we have an action-packed summit Thank you for joining. We're gonna begin our road trip around the heartland first. We're gonna start with a story from the heart of Kansas, but I'm gonna meet you back in Minnesota in a moment. My name is Kent Winter, and I'm a full-time farmer in South Central Kansas, just outside the city of Wichita. I'm fifth generation. I'm actually on the farm that uh, my grandfather was on. Well, from my perspective from the tractor seat, the bottom line is, unless we're to export our abundance of grain overseas, I probably only have a need to plant half of my acreage. And so when you think about foreign aid, what's it worth? You can't put a price on it. And the foreign aid that we can be a part of helps us to stay somewhat profitable so we can be in business again next year. But the greater thing is being able on a humanitarian basis to help folks overseas that really truly need the food. I am the executive director of the American Air Chamber of Commerce. I am also the chairwoman for the East Michigan District Export Council. One of our main goals is to make sure that we continue to see America as the world global leader that it is. Some of the fastest growing markets in the world are overseas. And we have to keep in mind, in order to keep our market growing, we need to be selling to all these markets, providing foreign aid and, and what it's worth. We're helping them, but we're also helping our own economy. And this is how we will continue to grow in America. This is how we're gonna help our manufacturers and all our companies increase their exports to be able to increase employment in the heartland of America. Foreign aid means that we're helping to create jobs here at home and we're creating a safer, more prosperous world. Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Tina Smith, and it is great to join you at this inaugural Heartland Summit. This topic is just so important. You and I know that our nation's foreign assistance programs in health care, agricultural development, and political stability all help build resilient, prosperous, and peaceful partners across the world. These targeted investments strengthen our national security, develop markets for U.S. products and services, and create new opportunities for trade. 
As a member of the Senate Agriculture Committee, I've seen firsthand how foreign assistance has created new markets for Minnesota ag producers. Minnesota exported over $20 billion of ag and economic goods last year alone, all while creating, supporting thousands of jobs with great Minnesota companies like Cargill and Land O'Lakes. So, as Congress works to pass the FY22 budget, I'll continue to support strong foreign assistance. Thank you for your advocacy for investment in U.S. foreign assistance and engagement with the world. And I look forward to continuing to work with you in Washington. Well, welcome back, and we're now in Minnesota. So <laughs> I don't need to tell this audience about all of the global challenges on the world stage from you know, rising humanitarian crisis, the global pandemic, growing rates in poverty, uh, hunger, of course, climate. So our first conversation, we're gonna touch on these challenges, but we're gonna do it through the lens of agriculture, given its, its centrality to the heartland and how it impacts our health, our economics, our, our security. And, and look at the question of how how uh, these, these, these challenges impact feeding the world. And fortunately, we have an expert panel to help guide us. So let me introduce them and, and jump right into them. With us today is a wonderful friend of ours, Representative Dean Phillips. He, he represents Minnesota's third congressional district, an impressive members, uh, member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and a wonderful friend of USGLC. Uh, also with us is, is John Nash, the Corporate Senior Vice President and protein salt leader from Cargill. I already mentioned Cargill is the chair of our Heartland Partnership, so welcome John as well. And last but not least, Bonnie Glick, uh, who served as the Deputy Administrator of USAID and was just recently announced as the Director of the Center for Tax Diplomacy at Purdue. Welcome all three of you. So Congressman, I'm gonna start with you and our first round of questions is, I'm gonna take on a different challenge and ask each of you and Congressman, I'm gonna start about with the intersection of climate and agriculture. It is not lost on any of us that there are higher temperatures worldwide and worsening droughts that are directly impacting the, the ag sector. And I believe you and I have talked about the disproportional impact climate is having on some of the most vulnerable uh, globally, particularly in the developing world. So could you kick this conversation off on, on how you see the connection between global climate debate and its impact on local Minnesota, but the heartland at large agricultural issues, how concerned you are about the extreme weather on agricultural production and export, exports, and, and how, how Congress is handling uh, and addressing what, what a lot of us call the global resilience agenda. Mm -hmm. Congressman Phillips, welcome. Thank you, Liz. Uh, let me start by answering your question. Uh, am I concerned? Yes, uh, gravely. Uh, is Congress doing enough? Not at all. Uh, and I'll speak to that in just a moment. But uh, first, greetings to all of you, to Liz, to USGLC, uh, to my co-panelists, Bonnie and John. Uh, and a thank you to Cargill, of course, based in my district, uh, for your support uh, of this initiative. Uh, grateful uh, to see all of you. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say, too, when I think about USGLC and I think about leadership, U.S. global leadership, it can't just come from muscle. Uh, it's got to come from, from hustle. Uh, we've got to We've got to use soft diplomacy. Uh, we've got to feed those in need. We've got to vaccinate those who right now cannot uh, and regain our mantle of leadership uh, by doing the most humane uh, of initiatives. Uh, and that I believe begins uh, with feeding people. To your question, Liz, uh, about uh, the heartland and, and farmers, I, I hear increasingly from farmers uh, in Minnesota and, and around the country uh, about their concerns about climate change and extreme weather events. Uh, they're the uh, proverbial canaries in the coal mine, for goodness sakes. It's not a political issue. Uh, it's fact. It's reality. Uh, it also adds a lot of uncertainty to their lives and, and their professions um, uh, for obvious reasons, especially in an uh, era of tariff issues and supply chain issues and, um, and global demand patterns that have changed considerably because of COVID. So you know, they know what we have to do, uh, but we have to collectively in Congress uh, and at the state level uh, develop the right policies and ensure they're well supported. We cannot expect uh, farmers uh, or agriculture around the world uh, to do the things necessary that we believe is necessary uh, to at least try to mitigate climate change or at least become more resilient. I do believe that takes a public effort, a collective effort, and I believe it has to start in the heartland. 
there's no question whatsoever. Uh, you know, I support things like carbon fee and dividend, for example, uh, uh, grid resilience, a, a number of initiatives that uh, have some support in Congress, but not nearly enough. And I ask that all of you, to the extent that you can, help advocate for that because we need to push many others uh, on board. Uh, and I also, if those, I'm sure most of you have, but if you haven't seen the documentary, Kiss the Ground on uh, Regenerative Agriculture, it is transformative. Uh, and for those in Congress, which is most with short attention spans, uh, such, uh, su you know, such ways to convey the reality uh, and how we can do something about it is integral. And again, that starts with many of us, all of you on this call. Uh, and with that, I express gratitude uh, and uh, hope that we can explore these intersections and stop talking and start acting. Well, thank you. And, and you're certainly one of the leads on the acting portion of it. So thank you. John, I, I, we could talk about climate, but I want to turn to another challenge. And that's, of course, the global pandemic and the impact it's been having on, on food insecurity here in the U.S. and overseas. I saw a recent study in the U.N. that found a record 155 million people facing acute hunger just last year, another 41 million on the brink of starvation now already this year. Cargill has played a, a key role in combating hunger, uh, both here and overseas. And, and I want you to talk about when it comes to combating food insecurity, you know, why Cargill, a, country, a, a company like Cargill is invested in feeding the world, and why promoting food security global matters to, 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 to farmers, to a company like, like Cargill, if you could address that. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Liz. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. And you're right, that statistic is incredibly sad. And, and I believe and we believe at Cargill that we absolutely have a responsibility to keep the food system working. Um, our role as Cargill in moving food from where it's grown to where it's needed has never been more important and has to happen even in the, in the middle of a pandemic. And so uh, we've done a lot to support farmers and promote food security. Uh, the first thing and the most important thing actually is starting with protecting our people. Uh, certainly feeding the world and uh, creating markets for farmers and ranchers is not possible uh, if we don't first take care of the health and well-being of our people on the front line of the food system. And so that has to be our top priority, and it is our top priority. Uh, in addition to that, we've been supporting uh, communities around the world. We contributed over $110 million uh, over the last year to help with health and, safe, health and safety of uh, neighbors around the world. Um, we've contributed resources, food, uh, employee volunteer hours, something I'm really proud of, uh, to organizations like food banks and clinics uh, as a way to support the communities in which we operate. So doing a lot there. Also proud of the fact that we provided a lot of support for doctors and nurses on the front lines uh, who needed safety equipment, medical tools. And all over the world, we donated uh, personal protective equipment to help make sure those important people could uh, play their role um, and taking care of people. So, um, and then why is it important? It, first of all, it's the right thing to do. Uh, we absolutely have a responsibility to ensure that we're able to feed the additional 2 billion people who will be living on this planet uh, 30 years from now. Uh, the population growth is amazing and we have to be prepared for that. Um, but to do that, we have to have access to growing world markets um, because U.S. farmers are going to be critical to meeting that demand. So, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we've got to work together to ensure that our food system is dependable and resilient, no matter what happens in the world. Yeah, I sure heard that from a lot of businesses that we talked about, talked with over the last year. Uh, I, I know, Bonnie, you could talk about that one as well, but I'm going to give you another challenge. And the one I want to pick up on, picking on what John said, is something you've worked on a lot over your career, which is the economic empowerment of women and girls. I, I, I saw a statistic at USAID, your old stomping ground, that if women have the same access to pr productive resources as men, they could increase the farm yields by 20 to 30 percent, feeding an additional 150 million people, which is pretty staggering. So, so talk about on this challenge question, why investments in economic empowerment of women and girls will lift up societies and poverty? And again, why does it matter to our own economic recovery? Bonnie, welcome. Liz, thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me here today. Congressman Phillips, it's great to see you, John. It's good to see you. Uh, and this is such an important question. I personally love the, the line that you're taking because I myself own a farm. And when I would travel with USAID to developing countries, I often met with smallholder farmers. Now, mind you, I'm a smallholder farmer in the Cornhusker state 
My acreage, though, doesn't compare with an industrial agricultural giant like Cargill. But smallholder farmers in developing countries are farming very small parcels of land. So think along the lines of like a quarter acre to maybe two acres. And when women are involved in the farming, especially when they're the farm owners, it has been recorded, as you noted, Liz, that they're not only more productive in their outputs than a lot of their male farmer counterparts, but also they invest in advance in next year's crops and they plan for next season's harvest. When women in developing countries take out small or micro loans, their repayment rates are over 95%. This is an extraordinary figure, over 95%, but it shows where their focus is. It's on growing their businesses and on being eligible for future loans, oftentimes larger loans, which they also repay. Now think for a minute about where women invest the money that they make from their farming endeavors. They tend to invest in three main areas, schooling for their kids, nutritious foods for their families, and they reinvest in their businesses. Women also tend to be more open to exploring new ways to farm. And this is because many women farmers in developing countries are the first in their families to take on that role. They aren't necessarily beholden to the concept of we farm this way because it's the way seven, eight generations of farmers in my family have always farmed. They're often open to technological advances, some simple, some a little more sophisticated. And this is a winning prospect, I think, across the board. So this is just one reason why it makes sense to invest in the economic empowerment of women and girls around the world. But what does it do for us here at home? Think about what's being farmed. And think about, say, farms in West Africa, maybe in Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast. This is where a very large percentage of cocoa comes from. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I love chocolate ice cream. And imagine increasing cocoa yields by, like you said, 20 to 30%. That means one or two things for us, either more chocolate ice cream here or less expensive chocolate ice cream or both. So I'm going to call that a win. When we work with an Ivorian woman farmer with her cocoa crops through financing, through the development of new and more resilient seeds, or even through softer skills development like mentoring, this makes an important contribution to the overall role that women play in what you called global economies, global economies that have local impacts, both for them and for us. That's awesome. That's awesome. Before I leave this, this, this part of the conversation, Cargill, John, I know, has a number of programs on women economic empowerment through agricultural initiatives. What do you, what, give, give one example of this, because I love we're kind of moving from challenges to these, these great event opportunities and innovations that are working. Give us one example of what you're doing, because COVID is definitely picking up on that point has had as a dip, disproportional impacts on women. John? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, and uh, this is something we've got to be better at. There's no doubt um, that uh, helping uh, uh, end, end extreme poverty can't, can't happen unless we break down barriers, hold girls and women back. It just can't happen. So we've got a bunch of things we're doing around the world. One thing I'm really proud of is an initiative, initiative called Hatching Hope. Uh, this is an initiative where we train women farmers in poultry production, and we're aiming to improve the nutrition and economic livelihood of over 100 million people uh, in this initiative by 2030. So that's meaningful impact. Um, uh, around the world. And so one other thing I've mentioned that I'm really proud of at Cargill, we're globally committed to achieving gender parity and leadership roles by 2030. We're making great progress there. Um, and that'll serve as a strong example of, of doing things uh, differently here long-term for the, for the world. So we're really proud of that. Uh, Congressman, I'm gonna turn the baton over to one of our advisory committee members, who's also a member of our next gen to ask the next question to you, Christopher McLean. Hey, good afternoon, Congressman, and greetings from Michigan. Um, so my question, um, well, the agriculture industry puts food uh, on our plates every day, and also uh, the Export-Import Bank of the United States uh, is committed to supporting rural businesses 
and selling commodities and as well as equipment abroad. Um, as a US GLC, Next Gen Global Leader, and as my time uh, in my time as a Pathways Fellow at Exum, uh, I've seen firsthand the value of development finance uh, opening up markets for U.S. agricultural exports, uh, especially as XM partners with more closely with the Development Finance Corporation. Um, my question is, how does development finance benefit American farmers by promoting agricultural exports? And how have you been working in Congress uh, to support development financing? Well, thank you, Christopher. And, and the answer is substantially. Uh, I'm a, a big advocate for using our public dollars to build the foundation uh, for exporters, especially in the ag community. Uh, it is integral to our work. Uh, a lot of my time on the Foreign Affairs Committee is, is spent doing so uh, because it is imperative and I feel it a responsibility to open up uh, new markets for American businesses uh, in a variety of industries to be, to be forthright. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the U.S. African Development Foundation, of course, USAID, uh, and I also believe strongly, Christopher, and I don't think we talk often enough about the need to ensure that those uh, who are making a decision on the allocation of our dollars uh, be local, uh, not do it from Washington uh, or from other parts of the world, but to have feet in the street, on the ground, uh, and to very, very much understand uh, those uh, we're supporting uh, in the markets we intend to open up. Uh, as for the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation, uh, another critical tool, but they've been disadvantaged, if you ask me, uh, because uh, their programs are treated more like grants uh, than loans, and as, as you know better than I. And I think it's time that we treat them uh, in the net present value format uh, like traditional debt financing is done. That'll help DFC optimize uh, their work overseas. Uh, and we've got a lot of competition, as you all know, my friends around the world, from our competitors. Uh, uh, I don't want them to become our adversaries, uh, but we should compete. Uh, we have the resources, both human and financial, uh, and we need to ensure uh, that we mobilize uh, and with intention uh, do so all around the world. Uh, you have been a great champion of the Development Finance Corporation. Thank you. Bonnie, let me ask you a quick question. The agricultural industry throughout the heartland, as you know, the congressman knows, depends on I mean, Cargill, John, you know, depends on markets in the developing countries for, for exports. Uh, you know, Minnesota alone exported $20 billion to foreign markets in 2020. But because of the global pandemic, the decline was 10% from the year prior. I saw a statistic that International Chamber of Commerce has predicted the global economy could lose more than $9 trillion if we don't provide vaccines to the developing world to try to get the, 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 glo the global pandemic under control. So our, our economic recovery, as we've been talking about, is completely tied with getting the virus under control. The USGLC, the chamber, other businesses have called for vaccinating 70% of the world by this time next year. So given your tech expertise, you're, you're wearing your old hat at USAID, how important is it to, to get the global response right to make sure that U.S. government and public-private partnerships are working together for our economic recovery. Liz, we all know we have no choice but to be successful in vaccine distributions around the world. I've heard you say it so many times, what's it worth to us? COVID has shown us that if there's a disease abroad, there's a disease here. We saw it with Ebola and Zika, we saw it with AIDS, and now we're seeing it in the most frightening way in a century with COVID-19. COVID is an invisible enemy, but we can protect ourselves through vaccinations. That said, we also need to protect ourselves here by distributing vaccines abroad. I would argue that Operation Warp Speed is the first successful U.S. government-sponsored public-private partnership since the Manhattan Project, which ended World War II. Now, against this invisible enemy, we have effective weapons, vaccines developed and deployed across the United States in record time, but we need to get shots in people's arms around the world, too. Thanks to the generosity of U.S. taxpayers, we committed the largest U.S. contribution in history to Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. We committed $1.6 billion as a nation. 
This was before COVID was raging all over the world. And in the advent of COVID, we committed even more in order to distribute vaccines to people all over the world in poor countries, as well as in middle income and wealthy countries that weren't producing vaccines themselves. We're working with international partners to distribute the life-saving and life-protecting US vaccines. And we've seen that vaccines developed here by great companies like Pfizer in Michigan like Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, are effective. We're also seeing that vaccines developed in other countries are not effective, and we're seeing that in countries all over the world, they want the American vaccines. We need to redouble our efforts to get those vaccines to them. Our vaccine development and subsequent rollout demonstrated the very best of American ingenuity, technology, innovation, and global generosity. Thank you. Let me ask each of you one last question in our few minutes re remaining. So, so short answers to a tough question. Um, you know, over the past few years, uh, as I mentioned at the start, USGOC has literally had hundreds of conversations in Minnesota and throughout the, the heartland. We've heard from Democrats, Republicans, independents, businesses, nonprofits, that America's development and diplomacy programs really matter into our, our, our economic and, and health and security interests and reflect our values in our country. And as, you know, picking up on Bonnie, what you just said, you know, COVID-19 has exacerbated many of the gains that we have made throughout the world, particularly in tackling global hunger. And, but I, you're all Midwesterners and, as, and I know you're optimistic at heart. So I'd love to hear what gives you hope that we're gonna meet this moment and rise to the challenges of feeding the world uh, hopefully nutritiously, because it's the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. So I'm going to ask each of you to just share, you know, a, a, a one minute of, of what, what gives you hope. And uh, uh, Bonnie, maybe we'll kick off with you, John, and then Congressman, give you the, the, the last word, uh, Bonnie. Great. Liz, it's a, it's a wonderful way to end. Like I said, America is the most generous country in the history of the world. And the American people are the most generous people in the history of the world. This is who we are. It's in our DNA. We reach out our hands to the strangers. We live by the mantra at the base of the Statue of Liberty as voiced by an immigrant to the United States, Emma Lazarus. Give me your tired, your poor. This is who America is. So that gives me hope. It gives me hope that even though the country feels terribly divided now, we are all fundamentally able to demonstrate the great American value of generosity. Beautiful, thank you. John, what gives you hope? Sure, um, so listen, I, I spent the early years of my life uh, growing up on a farm in Missouri where we, we raised turkeys, uh, cattle, various crops. I'm so proud of the values that I was raised with and the role that my family helped play and feeding the world. So I care deeply about the work we're doing. What gives me hope is there's a, so many people in, in this conversation and around the country that feel the exact same way that I do. Um, we have to engage, uh, think, and work together to bring food and food security to the world. So I'm very, very hopeful. Thank you. Now, Congressman, you're in the thick of things. And a lot of us from the, from the outside feel like Nobody's getting along on anything. So please, what gives you hope? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you've got a couple hours because a lot of things give me hope. All of you <laughs> give me hope. Uh, every time I meet with young people, uh, they give me hope. At the Minnesota State Fair recently, for example, uh, nothing more inspiring uh, than seeing those young people with big ideas, uh, shared principles and values, and a lot of energy. And on a more personal basis, people like Dusty Johnson, my dear friend, Republican from South Dakota, who knows a whole lot more about agriculture than I do. Uh, we are friends, we are partners, we respect one another. Uh, we don't get a lot of airtime on cable news or on Twitter, and that's just fine. Uh, as you all know, there are workhorses and show horses, and Dusty's definitely a workhorse. Uh, but people like him uh, give me hope. Uh, and the fact is there are good friendships, good partnerships, good relationships in Congress. Uh, we have to do a better job collectively of exposing those and promoting those and celebrating those. Uh, it's Sunday school lessons and kindergarten lessons, and that's what gives me hope. Well, if we were all in person, we'd be given a standing ovation for Bonnie Glick, John Nash, and Congressman Phillips. Thank you for an excellent first stop on our road trip today. Uh, so thank you. I'll applaud for everybody. Great. So buckle up, my friends. We're heading to Ohio next.
But first, we're going to have a stop in Indiana and North Dakota. Thank you all for joining us. Bye, everybody. Hi, I'm Erica Camarillo. I'm based here in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I work for Bethany Christian Services overseeing our unaccompanied children's programming. Here at Bethany, we serve orphans and vulnerable children around the world. We do work in several countries like Colombia, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Haiti. Our partnership with USAID and Born Aid demonstrates the generosity of the American people. When we help orphans and vulnerable children and families thrive, we are showing the best of our country. Foreign aid, what's it worth? To me, it's our future. It's important to be engaged with our members of Congress because what happens globally affects us here. We believe that thriving families create stable societies. When we invest in children, you know, we're creating a safer society and giving children opportunities to make the world a safer place for all of us. Greetings to the Heartland Summit of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. As always, it's a, it's a great honor for me to be speaking with you today and to recognize the crucial work that you all do. You know, some of North Dakota's most valuable exports, of course, are our work ethic, our leadership, and, of course, the common sense of the great people of our state. And with global health challenges, food shortages, uh, increased economic competition, uh, the rising unrest in volatile regions of our world, those esteemed qualities that we're known for are needed more than ever before. Fortunately, we're in a position to act. You know, North Dakota is a globally connected state. We always have been. Our producers provide feed and fuel to a world in desperate need of it, which opens doors to make global connections, which makes our state and our partners stronger, healthier, more diverse, more prosperous, and clearly safer. And it's through those partnerships that we're going to be able to tackle the greatest challenges the world faces today. So, I hope your time together is productive and meaningful. And as always, if I or my team can ever be of assistance to you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks for your time today and for all of your service and all you do. And God bless you in your work. Well, welcome. You've made it to Ohio for the next leg of our road trip across the heartland. I'm Alex Grant, the director of USGLC's Heartland Initiative, and the next conversation will focus on the importance of development and diplomacy to our national security and our economy. Now, as we continue to see the impacts of COVID-19, truly a national security and economic threat that knows no borders, we know that our global engagement has a direct impact here at home. We've seen COVID-19 worsen many global challenges across the past 18 months, more than 155 million people are suffering from acute hunger due to conflict and instability, an increase in violent extremism with violence in Africa increasing by 43% in 2020, rising authoritarianism worldwide with elections postponed or canceled in at least 78 countries or territories. And there are many other interconnected problems of climate, health, food, and water security, some of the most pressing challenges in global development that, if not managed, have national security consequences. So it's now more important than ever to invest in development to offset these negative trends. And we know it pays off because experts say that for every $1 the United States spends to prevent conflict, we save $16 in response cost. So I'm so excited to speak to today's panel about how investment overseas impacts our communities here at home. And joining me today on screen are General Dennis McCarthy and C.D. Glenn, Global Head, of Global Head of Philanthropy and Vice President of the PepsiCo Foundation with the title made to twist my tongue. <laughs> Welcome to you both. General McCarthy, I'm going to start off with you because there is a topic that had come up time and time again throughout our conversations across the heartland this year, and that's competition with the Chinese government. As many know, China has ramped up its economic engagement in Latin America and Africa, spending approximately $575 billion in infrastructure since 2013, now surpassing the United States as Brazil's top trading partner. General, how does global engagement better equip the U.S. to compete economically with China and to safeguard our national security? General McCarthy. Well, let me give you a, 
personal example, the, the very first time I went to the Horn of Africa, um, I was absolutely flabbergasted to find how much activity was going on in that, you know, rather remote and un underdeveloped part of the world, how much activity was going on with the Chinese. They were actively uh, developing, they were involved in oil production, all kinds of things. And it's, it's just one of many, many places that they are um, shaping the world uh, for themselves. The military thinks of operations or campaigns in phases. And the very first phase, we've given the name phase zero. And phase zero is when you try to set the conditions for success later if you, if you uh, have to go further in the campaign. And that's exactly, in my opinion, what China is doing. They're out hustling on their concept of phase zero. And it's, it's critically important that we do the same thing. The military certainly got a role in phase zero, but it doesn't have exclusive responsibility. The, the rest of government and industry have to be involved as well if we're gonna set the conditions for success down the road. Absolutely, and, and CD, as a, the, the general just mentioned, phase zero, this investment in, in Africa. Uh, with your extensive experience, including your former role as president and CEO of the U.S. African Development Foundation, you know the value of U.S. Uh, development and diplomacy abroad in Africa. You also know the boundless potential of the region. Uh, so what are the opportunities to invest and contribute to economic growth on the African continent what kinds of investment is PepsiCo making in the continent as well? Great, great question. Thank you. And thanks for being here. You know, as during my time as president and CEO of the U.S. African Development Foundation, we invested in African lives and livelihoods by addressing some of Africa's biggest challenges and turning them into opportunities. Challenges around food security and linking with Feed the Future, insignificant energy access and, and linking to programs like Power Africa and unemployment, particularly amongst women and youth in programs um, aligned with Young African Leaders Initiative. So the value was direct in relationship in relation to our global security, our global peace and security efforts, but they also linked to global development. But tangentially, those early stage investments really played a role in USADF being in the startup business, really helping African enterprise and entrepreneurs in a startup role. And now at, at Pepsi and uh, the PepsiCo found Foundation, it's really leading to trade and investment. And so PepsiCo's investment as the largest food and beverage company in the country and one of the largest in the world, you know, our brands and our beverages and our, our, our consumed by nearly one, people, 1 billion people each day. And our reach is global, but we remain committed to a multi-local approach, believing that it's our duty as a company to contribute to the prosperity of the communities where we operate by contributing to GDP, by creating jobs for the local populations, by contracting and sourcing with local suppliers, and connecting and engaging with local community stakeholders. So our investments in Africa and in African enterprise are on the scale up um, efforts. And this is where we've had a presence in, for instance, in South Africa for more than 20 years. But just two years ago, we had um, the largest acquisition in Africa where we purchased Pioneer Foods, which at the time was the largest food company in Africa, based in South Africa. And with this purchase, we're demonstrating and furthering our investments and commitment to Africa as a destination for trade and investment. And we also linked to that acquisition, launched a $35 million development fund to assist emerging farmers and to support education by enabling initiatives that provide training and upskilling, enhancing a skills pipeline and to incubate technological support for small businesses. So the, the, the challenges are, are broad, but they do lead to opportunities and PepsiCo is committed to the continent and investing in Africa with a trade and investment focus, as well as the broader development agenda. Fantastic. You know, those, the, that private industry is so critical to the development projects and the public-private partnership that we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes here. Uh, it's just so important. But before we get to that, I want to bring onto the screen John Hugo. Uh, John is one of our advisory committee members and is also the CEO of Rotary International. Uh, John, I know you have a question. Go right ahead. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, General CD, thank you very much for your, for your uh, thoughtful comments so far. Um, 
you know, you talked, CD, about the sort of uh, global development and it just sort of beyond dealing with the pandemic. And we've seen over the last 30 years, significant, significant progress in human development areas of education, health, uh, income growth, et cetera. And I think one of the challenges we're seeing now with the pandemic is these sort of second order impacts that are sort of threatening to turn back this 30 years of incredible development that we've, that we've seen. And so from your perspective, um, is this sort of a temporary phenomena or do you see this danger of, of rollback uh, continuing? Uh, what do we do about it? What are some of the mitigating factors we can uh, take into account and some of the steps we can take to, to, to ensure that some of these fantastic developments we've had over the last 30 years are, are not rolled back as a result of, of COVID and the pandemic? Uh, it's a great question and a, an important observation. The global health pandemic has exacerbated, obviously, food security and economic op opportunity in ways that that um, are just devastating across the global landscape as, as well as domestically. And so, you know, some of the ways in which we at PepsiCo has look, have looked at trying to fill gaps and see where the response is needed is really going local and being locally led. It's, this is in supporting proximate leaders. This is in supporting local communities directly. We talk about fast, um, sort of flexible funding directly from a philanthropic standpoint, directly into the hands of community, community members and community stakeholders. And also using that that um, local community approach, that locally led approach, that community driven approach with a real sense of collaboration. For instance, in, in terms of exacerbating existing or, um, inequities or challenges, let's think about economic opportunity and economic development for communities of color. There, there, there was a color of COVID in the sense where communities of color saw, saw some of the repercussions, the economic downturns from COVID um, exacerbate existing inequalities. And so at PepsiCo, we've launched two programs that really are addressing the pandemic challenges in terms of economic recovery and response, but also the historical racial um, systemic challenges that we've seen in this country. And so we've launched a Black Restaurant Accelerator Program, which is to, and we've also um, launched a Hispanic uh, Business Incubator Program, both of which both are independent $10 million efforts to invest directly into local restaurants, uh, bodegas, small businesses in communities directly that have been um, hurt economically by the pandemic, as well as the health challenges that the, their communities are facing. And so we've seen this locally led approach of being locally driven, but also in providing funding faster, more flexible directly to those who are facing the challenge and proximate to, to the issues being an approach that the private sector has been um, led by and working in connection with the, the public sector to really bring about community transformation as we do try to um, bounce back better, if you will, from the challenge of, of COVID-19 and the global pandemic. General McCarthy, any additional thoughts there? Yeah, I, I, I want to just kind of chime in that the kinds of things CD is talking about critically important and reflect a, a long-term view of how to take action. And I think we need that same kind of long-term view from our political leaders, our governmental leaders at, at all levels to not get so caught up in the short-term day-to-day, minute-to-minute kind of things but take the long, take the long view. Um, we all come back, the, those of us who have been, you know, with global leadership for a long time, remember Jim Mattis uh, when he was in uniform telling the Congress, you know, if you shortchange diplomacy and development, you're going to have to buy me more ammunition. Mm -hmm. And that means taking the long view and understanding that resourcing development, resourcing diplomacy isn't a competition for resources with, uh, with the military. It's, it's an adjunctive sort of act and it reflects those people taking a, a long view. And I hope we will continue to have that. I hope it will uh, continue to be the way our leaders think about the world and the problems that we all face. Absolutely. You got to be able to, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time, right? It's the old adage there. So, um, you know, moving on and thinking about this private sector engagement that CD has touched on a couple of times here, you think about healthcare in the heartland. It's such a major industry from the Pfizer vaccine manufacturing in Kalamazoo, Michigan to P&G here in Ohio. 
And over the last 18 months, we've really seen that collaboration with the private sector is vital to mobilizing a, a robust global response to end this pandemic. CD, where do you see the opportunities for greater collaboration between the public and private sector to, to fill the gaps as well as to address the barriers that I know you know well to vaccinating the world, helping our economy recover and, and ending the pandemic? Thanks. Thanks for the question. Great question. And before going into that response, let me just say that um, this conversation around the heartland is really near and dear to PepsiCo. We we are at our at our um, core an agricultural com company, and so we've invested in not only what is being farmed in the heartland, but how how things are, are are being farmed and taking this regenerative agriculture approach and restoring natural ecosystems is really critical. And so I just couldn't start talking um, in the heartland forum without sort of saying PepsiCo is an ag, ag company, and we keep farmers at, at and farming community. Communities. That's where I want to pivot to farming communities at the um, center of all of all that we do. Looking at this from a community led approach, that's where I think we see the greatest opportunity. The general said it great, not only for the near term, but for the long term, but putting communities front and center. We talk about PepsiCo being a global multinational, but we're multi-local. You know, everywhere that we operate, we operate as a local entity. And so that's really important. But building on what we do and with um, consumers of our products, customers who buy our products, a real focus on communities from which we source our ingredients um, for our products and those who manufacture and deliver them. You know, COVID-19 for us, we, we had to stand up and not only for our employees around the country, over 100,000 employees throughout the United States so that they could overcome those challenges, but to keep delivering for, for people globally. And we invested over $100 million in philanthropic investments in COVID response and recovery in the U.S. and across um, the globe. And again, those efforts were locally led, community driven with community members, regulators, legislators, front and center um, in collaboration with them. Let me give two quick examples globally. One is around vaccinations and global health. So we partner with local nonprofit organizations and government officials around the world to launch extensive community relief um, programs to support ongoing efforts against COVID-19 and really an, with a focus on access to vaccinations and establishing COVID care centers equipped with beds and life-saving medical equipment, including oxygen, oxygen tanks. So in India, the PepsiCo Foundation partnered with a local nonprofit, Sustainable Environment and Ecological Development Society, which is a leading nonprofit organization there, to launch these extensive community relief efforts to support the government of India's ongoing efforts against COVID-19 across five states. We provided over 100,000 100, vaccine doses to communities administered through local health systems, set up five COVID care centers, and donated over 100 oxygen uh, concentrators provided to the government. And a very similar effort in um, Thailand with a great American NGO care, where we, we help with feeding programs for over 100,000 Thai citizens, providing local health insurance for Thai farmers and providing regional hospitals uh, with critical medical resources. So we just see this locally led approach um, as an opportunity for government, for business, for society to come together, um, not only for the short term, but for the long term. Absolutely. Uh, so in our last couple of minutes here, I have a, a, a question for you all that Liz kind of laid out at the beginning, because we have this new campaign that we've launched of global health, diplomacy, foreign aid, what's it worth? Uh, so I want to ask each of you, what's it worth? CD, for me, you hit the nail on the head as, as a kid who grew up in a farming community, community a key. Uh, so I want to go to General McCarthy first. What is it worth to you for these global investments? As uh, people have said before, um, development is uh, a lot less expensive than war. And if we make investments both in terms of uh, time and effort and, and an approach to the world, the worth is going to be less risk that we have to put men and women at risk in war around the world. Uh, we won't ever eliminate that hazard. We won't ever eliminate the risk, but we can certainly reduce it. And that, to me, is uh, worth just about everything. I've got two sons who uh, wear the uniform and uh, uh, keeping them out of, uh, out of harm's way or any more in harm's way than they are now. Um, that's worth a lot to me. Absolutely. Protect our country's greatest treasure there. 
Uh, CD, over to you. Great, thanks for, thanks for your question. I know we're, we're short of time. So let me just be very uh, clear that, you know, what, it, what it's worth for us, it's, it's, it's everything. It's really not only our social license to operate, it is our license to operate. These communities at home and abroad are not just markets where we source and sell products. They're places where we and our employees and their families live and work and raise their children. So, you know, speaking to a Heartland audience, we bet the farm on it. We bet the farm on, on th this approach of being a positive com a company. We talk about being PepsiCo positive, where we have an emphasis around profitability. Yes, being a great American um, company that's going to be long lasting to the future, but also on people and the planet. So for us, it's everything. And that's why we, we care about this issues and why we're so grateful to be a part of this dialogue today. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you, Joe McCarthy, for you and your family's service to the country. And CD, I know you're from a military family as well, so thank you all uh, for your work. John, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and thank you all for joining us in Ohio. But uh, go grab a snack, buckle up. Next stop is Iowa. My name is Bernie Stone and I'm from Iowa. I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel with 20 years of service in the United States Army and served in five U.S. embassies as a foreign area officer. One of the great lessons that I learned is the importance of the State Department and the importance of the other elements of national power. It's really easy to send the military to try to fix your problems, but it's much more cost effective and better for everyone if you can figure out a way to do that before you have to send the military. I have lost colleagues and friends in our conflict in the last 20 years. So I'm a very strong advocate for the foreign affairs budget. And that is what foreign aid means to me. It means, it means me or my children not having to deploy to a complex zone. Hi folks, this is Senator Joni Ernst, junior senator for the great state of Iowa. Well, I'm sorry I can't be with you all in person today. I'm honored to share a few words at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition's inaugural Heartland Summit and to discuss the importance of investments in diplomacy, development, and food security to families in Iowa and across the Heartland. In Iowa, we're proud of the critical leadership position our state has when it comes to agriculture, one that makes the whole planet healthier, more secure, and more prosperous. As many of you know, our agriculture community plays an essential role, ensuring folks around the world have access to a reliable food supply chain. Last year, Iowa exported over $12.6 billion worth of goods, supporting over 412,000 local jobs, that's one in five jobs in Iowa. But it's not just agriculture. Students around the world come to Iowa to learn. As over 11,000 international students study at our state's colleges and universities, contributing over $352 million to our state's economy. Our state has a long history of engagement with the rest of the world. And it's important we continue that history as we grow our economy advance our national security, and our partnerships around the globe. In the U.S. Senate, I'll continue working to ensure the health, economic, and security interests of families in Iowa and around the country are represented on the world stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Beckering, USGLC's Director of National Engagement. Welcome to Iowa. It's your last stop on today's road trip, and it just so happens to be my favorite state. Now, I'll admit, I'm a little biased because I am a proud Iowan born and raised on a farm in Northwest Iowa. But you have to admit, you can't get more heartland than Iowa. So for our final conversation today, we're gonna take this global focus local. We're gonna discuss the role of our municipalities and our districts throughout the heartland and the role they have in promoting investments in agriculture and U.S. international affairs. We also want to look at how these programs deliver a meaningful return on investment to residents not only in Iowa, but across the heartland. But before we get to our panel, I am so pleased to welcome a truly great Iowan to kick us off today. Ambassador Terry Brandstad has experienced and seen it all. Starting his career as a member in the Iowa House of Representatives, 
He went on to serve as lieutenant governor and then two separate tours as governor of Iowa, making him the longest serving governor in Iowa history, and most recently serving as U.S. ambassador to China. Ambassador Brandstad has recently launched the Brandstad Churchill Group to provide advice and solutions to those seeking to navigate the challenges and opportunities associated with conducting business between the U.S. and China. So I can't think of anyone better suited to kick off our next discussion. Hello to all of you who have joined us today for this Heartland Summit. My name is Terry Branstead, former governor of Iowa and ambassador to the People's Republic of China. I wanna especially thank Liz Schreyer, CEO and president of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition for hosting this important gathering. So what are important international friendships worth for me, it's about building bridges that will help Americans succeed here at home. In 1985, this farm boy from Leland, Iowa, had the opportunity to host a small delegation of leaders from China. That small group was led by a man who we all know now as President Xi Jinping. Iowans and other leaders from across the heartland know that they play an important role in America's global engagement. We build friendships that help us feed the world, advance our economic interests, protect our national security, and showcase the best of our American values. Building and maintaining these international relationships has a direct positive impact on our state. That's why I was honored in 2016 to be appointed by President Trump to serve as the ambassador to China and to work with President Xi whom I met all those many years ago in Iowa. Local leaders across the nation's heartland are doing today what I did 35 years ago, creating lasting partnerships with leaders around the globe. Whatever you do, whether you're a mayor, a state representative, or other local elected official, you have the opportunity to represent your community, your country, and the farmers that are the backbone of our state's economy on the world stage. Your subnational diplomacy is making your communities better and more prosperous places to live. What are international friendships worth? Everything. Thank you so much, Ambassador Brandstad, and I could not agree more. It truly is about everything. It's worth everything. So I'm joined here today by two more impressive leaders from the state of Iowa. And we're gonna talk more about how these global issues are affecting us at the district and community levels. First, we have the Honorable Randy Feenstra, Congressman representing Iowa's fourth district. Representative Feenstra has an impressive career in public service, including serving as a city administrator, a county treasurer, an Iowa State Senator, and now, of course, in Congress. And the Honorable Frank County, Mayor of Des Moines, Iowa, Iowa's largest city. A businessman, Mayor County is the longest serving mayor in Des Moines history, having served five terms. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us. So let me start with you, Representative Feenstra. And I was struck by the statistics uh, we have heard from Senator Ernst and Ambassador Brandstad. And that is really digging into um, what an impact global trade and the economy has on Iowa. So in 2020, Iowa exported uh, over $12 billion worth of goods to international markets. And today, nearly 20% of all the jobs in the states are supported by trade. But what really has struck me over the years is that when you look at many of the countries to which Iowa is exporting, uh, these, these top markets are actually former recipients of U.S. foreign assistance, and that includes Mexico, it includes Japan. So I guess what I would like to hear from you uh, in, in your leadership role, and, and you know you serve on some powerful committees, you know, how is Iowa's economic future directly tied to these emerging markets? And we recognize the toll the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has taken. Uh, on the economy. And, and I'm curious from your 
you know, purview. How do our efforts to support the global economy, how are they ultimately, you know, paving the way for the U.S. exporters to get back to business? You know, so Iowa can remain this, this health, retain this healthy trade. Well, Michelle, thank you for the question, and thank you to U.S. Global Leadership Coalition for putting this on. This is just wonderful, and I'm just absolutely passionate about talking about what Iowa does to feed the world. And it's not only feeding the world, but what we do for manufacturing, all these other areas that, that are global. Um, our, my district and Iowa, like you noted, we are the largest crop growing and ethanol producing district uh, in the country. Uh, we are number one or two when it comes to hog and cattle production, and uh, it also third in poultry and other products. And all these things uh, are typically exported. Uh, and when you export, it creates markets where we can keep prices that are sustainable for our producers, which then turns to help our local main streets, our hospitals, our schools, and everything like that. So it's all tied together on how this all plays out. And over, over the last several years, we've been you know, watching China and, and Taiwan and so many other countries that have to feed a lot of mouths. And that's where phase one agreement, the USMCA has come in to where, where they can buy our commodity products, corn, soybeans, cattle, hogs, whatever it might be, because they need it to feed their people. And so it, it becomes a great in, uh, a partnership uh, with these countries uh, as we can produce it and then also uh, sell it. And then it also helps our economy back in, back in Iowa uh, and uh, helps the world go around with, uh, you know, including our hospitals and schools and things like that. So, and then finally, we also saw the effect when, when, our supply chain gets hung up when COVID is hit um, and all of a sudden things slow down. Uh, it really creates a, a significant effect uh, on the commodity markets and then also our producers because if you stop for one second or one day buying our products, uh, there's a tremendous backup. And we saw that with COVID. And for us, I think around the world, there was a, a, an interesting wake up call to say how important it is uh, globally to have this smooth supply chain uh, happening. Hey, you know, listening to your remarks, it, it just strikes me that for you and for your district, in some ways, we can't not focus on this, right? I mean, not only is Iowa in, in your district, of course, feeding the world, but to your point, it really is, uh, you know, the foundation of the economy uh, in Northwest Iowa and just how important that is. So, let me move to you, uh, Mayor County, and I want to talk a little bit differently now, and I want to talk about sort of the international students. Um, I have myself always been so impressed by the intentional focus we have had here uh, in Iowa with our colleges and uni universities, and really that overt work to foster relationships uh, with, you know, educational systems globally. And I have recognized what a great impact that's had back home in not only, you know, leading to enhanced knowledge, uh, innovation, uh, but also a cultural appreciation and an opening really of um, our experiences to the rest of the world. But besides that, it's also crucial to our economy. Um, I was really struck to learn just how many students every year are international in the state of Iowa. And if I look at your alma mater, uh, Iowa State University, uh, the university hosts, you know, upwards of 3,600 international students every year. Um, but of course, due to the pandemic, um, international student enrollment is, is really down. So I guess my question for you is, let's talk a little bit more about international uh, students and visitors and why is that actually so important to the state of Iowa to have these visitors, right? To have these students studying at our schools. And, you know, talk to us a little bit more. I love this term of sub-national diplomats. And that's truly what you and Congressman Rep uh, Feenstra represent, right? You are doing so much of this bilateral engagement uh, in your perches as leaders in the state. So talk to me a little bit about how you see the importance of cultural diplomacy and exchange in Iowa. Well, Michelle, thanks for the question. And uh, I, um, uh, as both you and, uh, and Representative Feenstra have spent my life in Iowa and uh, am a proud resident uh, of, of the city of Des Moines. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that, that we have seen the importance of relations uh, internationally. We have a, a, 
multiple numbers of sister cities. And we send people to those cities, whether it's in China or whether it's Japan or whether it's France uh, or other areas around the world. We work with our local chamber of commerce uh, and uh, do exchanges. Actually uh, uh, did one with uh, uh, then Governor Branstead uh, to South America. And because it is important that we understand how connected everything is. I think it's incumbent on all leaders, local, regional, national leaders, mayors, governors, federal officials, business leaders, uh, community leaders, faith leaders. It's all our task to try to explain to Iowans and the American people how interconnected the world is. If we're not making that case, the case that happens internationally affects us domestically and locally, uh, that what happens, for instance, in Wuhan uh, affects Des Moines after a global pandemic that has killed more than 700,000 Americans, then we're not doing our job. Uh, from agriculture to climate, from security uh, to migration, what happens over there affects us over here. That is why I'm involved, uh, for instance, personally in uh, the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives. It's ICLEI. Global, which is an international network of over 1,900 local governments working together um, at this moment, uh, heading into uh, uh, Glasgow on climate change and to address the local and global climate crisis. I'm proud that uh, the city of Des Moines and, and work uh, what we have done to reducing our carbon footprint, creating green jobs and transforming our city our work in Des Moines, we think, uh, will have an impact, but without combining, communicating uh, in global cooperation, without a successful framework that drives all countries to reduce carbon, we will not solve the climate crisis. We need to engage with the world. Furthermore, there are many countries around the world that can't afford to make the changes needed that would benefit tremendously from new technologies. And it is our own self-interest help to help them develop and steer them towards a sustainable future and solutions. Just think about all the people in India and Africa who don't have electricity. And, uh, but they're gonna get it. Do they need to use carbon-based fuels or should we suggest that they, like Iowa, uh, start using wind and solar and geothermal? There's a role for all of us to play and for the federal government to make uh, through foreign aid targeting those countries and communities that need assistance in making a sustainable transition and point them in the right direction. That is why our work uh, in the work of USGLC is so important. I appreciate that you're making the case for the development of assistance, not purely because it's the right thing to do, which it is, but also because it is our own interest to address the problems where they start and before they get here. Mayor County, I could not agree more. And, and listening to you say it, it brings it to life, right? Because as a mayor, you're at the you know first line of defense when it comes to COVID, uh, climate, all of these things in your district. But in some ways that can be an ice isolation, right, if, if we're not working overseas, if there's not also equal action uh, somewhere else. And, and I couldn't agree with you more. That's why I think our investments internationally, um, supporting that development so we have better trade partners, uh, so we have others helping us in this fight from everything, you know, to COVID to, you know, rebuilding the economy, that it will be profitable. Um, and, and so I thank you for that. One of the greatest, I think, um, privileges of working at USGLC is the fact that we have such strong support and memberships in the states across the country. And I'm so delighted right now uh, to ask one of our advisory committee members from Iowa, Kim Reed, uh, to join us today and um, to ask you some questions on behalf of the advisory uh, committee. And, and Kim is the executive director of Mission of Hope just a wonderful organization supporting those in need in Iowa. So Kim, over to you. Thank you, thank you for having me today. Representative Feenstra, um, for many Americans, including those of us here at Mission of Hope in Cedar Rapids, we encounter issues of poverty and hunger, 
Um, they're often seen at our churches, our mosques, our synagogues, and other faith-based places of worship and spirituality. Can you speak to how American values inform your policymaking as a representative from Iowa and your actions and in internal affairs? Yeah, Kim, thanks so much for the question. You know what? Um, first of all, sort of like you, my foundation is based on my faith, and my faith tells me that, you know what, we need to uh, work with all people, and, and, you know, whether that be those that are hungry, those that are in need. And when it comes to, I think, our rural communities, we all work together, whether it be in food banks, uh, whether that be working with our cooperatives, our producers, and so forth. I think we all have this engagement to, to help the world also. And, and we do that by making sure that we can feed those around the world and keep our commodity prices low enough that, you know, uh, third world markets can buy our, our products. And, and, you know, our only hope is as we move forward, just like it is in the U.S., is that it, that people can start going from, from a crop to, to more uh, uh, protein production of, of, you know, hogs and cattle and things like that. But this is the, 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 the process that we're working through uh, globally that, you know, we can sell more products to, to third world countries. And obviously they're buying many of our grains, but, uh, you know, the next step is to, to buy some of our, our livestock and poultry and things like that because it all works together. We want to feed the world. We don't want to see anybody hungry, whether it be in the U.S. Uh, or around the world. And, uh, you know, it's a very collaborative effort, uh, not only with each corporation, but with each producer, with each non or nonprofit organization, with, with each NGO, um, you know, and I think we're having tremendous successes uh, around the world with these collaborative efforts. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that, Kim. So let me um, let me ask here uh, one final question uh, to both of our panelists, and I want to get sort of your your parting remarks here. Um, so to Representative Feinstra and in Mayor County, as we're closing out our final panel, and this is our first ever Heartland Summit. I really want to again. Uh, talk about how it's so important that we're not only having these conversations, you know, at the U.S. Capitol or at City Hall in Des Moines, but also at the dinner table, right, with our friends, with our constituents. And so I want to ask both of you as we close, you know, bearing in mind you both have such unique experiences um, and you've seen the value of development and diplomacy up close, but how do you succinctly make that case, right, to your constituents, to your families, to your friends? How do you make the case that we can't ignore what happens globally and that it is so important to what happens here at home? So let me start with you, uh, Congressman Feenster, for your last words. Well, again, thank you for having me on. This is wonderful. But I, I think there's just so many connectors, and we see the connectors when the, when they tend to fail or, or change in, in the world markets. We saw that with COVID, when things started slowing down, when there was not as much as many purchases. We saw that with the phase one, phase one uh, China trade deal with USMCA when they came aboard, and we saw all the the production that 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 happened. Last year, or a year and a half, about last year at this time, we were at some record lows in our commodity markets. And this summer, we were at record highs because we were selling uh, to the export markets. And then we also look at the, the things that can also affect that. We have all the science and technology, but the other countries also have to look at that and say, all right, do we want these uh, different, uh, you know, G GMO corn or, or whatever it might be. And, and so there's a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, back and forth that needs to be done to uh, collaborate with these countries to say, hey, what we're growing is is very good. And I know right now with Mexico, we're having a little bit of a struggle with, with some of our corn products and things like that. But to me, it's it's working together, uh, talking about it around the table, how important it is uh, to have our products be exported. Uh, it affects, like I said, our hospitals and and, uh, and everything in the community. That's great, I couldn't agree more. And and to you, you know, Mayor County, I mean, how do you make this case? I mean, you yourself, right? You're a, an elected official. Uh, you're, you're dealing directly with this. How do you make the case for the importance of U.S. leadership around the world? 
You know, that's a great question. And uh, uh, again, I appreciate uh, being able to participate in this U.S. global leadership uh, conversation and, and want to uh, again emphasize the great work that you are all doing. Uh, but it, again, a great question and one that seems to become harder to answer in today's world of seemingly ever present, non stop, and anonymous communication that undermines the benefits of foreign aid. It is important, though, that we continue communicating the benefits of that aid in the work that you do uh, at Global Leadership um, so that, that that's a good start and it should be applauded. Uh, I've seen firsthand uh, that one form of communication that is highly effective but gets overlooked and especially has during the pandemic is the simple act of service volunteerism. Mm. Uh, this once-in-a-lifetime pandemic has seriously uh, disrupted the ability of Americans to connect with other communities uh, through volunteerism. As Midwesterners, we are well known uh, to get our hands dirty and to, uh, in order to sow seeds and, of our labor and also uh, extend that helping hand to our neighbors and, and even uh, do missions uh, in other countries, reconnecting people to organizations uh, whether they're faith-based uh, service organizations, Habitat for Humanity, Iowa International uh, uh, Center does a great job. They offer incredible volunteer opportunities uh, for everyday Iowans to connect and communicate directly with individuals around the world. And depoliticizing foreign assistance begins in our communities by reaching out and extending a helping hand to our neighbors and, and around the world. We also have an opportunity to communicate uh, with actions, uh, not just words or lip service, the benefits of America's investment in, in foreign aid and that fights uh, uh, climate change, as I talked about earlier, and promotes our ideals. Uh, foreign aid reminds me of an old proverb that I'm sure many of us are familiar with, a society grows great when old men plant trees under whose shade they know they'll never sit. And so uh, this can best be exemplified by former Governor Robert Ray's humanitarian uh, pledge to resettle thousands of Southeast Asian refugees in Iowa communities. More than 40 years have passed since those first Iowans, uh, those first individuals came to Iowa and became Iowans. We've had an opportunity now to emulate Governor Ray's tree planting and assist in the resettlement of hundreds of Afghani refugees, many of them who have risked their lives aiding our service members overseas in their communities. Uh, whether the topic is on climate change, resettlement of, of refugees, it's important to have events like this. Bringing leaders together to discuss and push these topics forward and is important to keep an open mind as we search for the, our right approach uh, if we are going to solve the world's biggest problems, it's going to take collaboration and it's going to take American leadership. And it also, by the way, will require American aid. Thanks for your work. Oh, Mayor, thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your words. Uh, Representative Feenstra, such a delight to have you as well as Ambassador Branstad and Kim Ream from our advisory committee. Thank you all for joining us here today. And until next time, we hope you enjoyed your trip to Iowa. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you everybody for joining us on our whirlwind road trip throughout America's heartland. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling more inspired than ever from hearing from Senator Small and Ernst and Kramer, Congressman Phillips and Feenstra, Ambassador Branstad, the mayor, the general, all the business leaders, and of course, from all of you. I am watching the Heartland Hub populate with all your stories. And that's exactly why we began this journey to hear from you. So I'm excited to continue the conversation. So just one more minute. I want you to meet the, 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 my colleagues who are continue the conversation. So Alex, kick it off of our four great colleagues who are gonna continue the conversation with our Heartland uh, activists, Alex. Okay. All right, Liz, I'm Alex Grant. I am so proud to be the director of the Heartland Initiative for USGLC. And I'm Nizar Jamal, the Midwest Outreach Director here. So great to see so many folks from my states, Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. 
everybody. My name is Eric Moore, Outreach Manager for the Ohio Valley. So happy to see everyone. Hi, y'all. My name is Alexandra Moyer. I'm the Central Outreach Manager, and it's great to have so many people from North Dakota, Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, and Missouri join us today. Well, that, that's the frontline team. There's lots behind them, but those are the four that are going to be following up all, with all of you. So keep the stories coming. Go on to heartland.usglc.org. Now, this summit for your friends, it's going to be available on demand. Uh, so for any of your friends and colleagues who couldn't join us today, please forward this on so that they can watch the amazing content that we all just got the honor to hear. Spread the word on what America's investments in foreign aid, diplomacy, global health are worth in your local communities. Policymakers need to hear not from me sitting in Washington, but from all of you in the heartland. And if we get this right, next year we get to gather together in person for Heartland Summit, though I don't know if we can move from all these cities in as quick of time. So everybody, thanks for joining us. Have a great day. And together, we're going to build a better, safer world. Thanks for joining us.